our friends are on medicine and everyone offered us some form of high dose medication and that's not what we wanted. We're never told that diet's gonna cure PMLE, right? In med school. We're never told that diet's gonna cure psoriasis. In fact, if you mention it, you're kind of like, like on the edge, right? And guess what? <laughs> it worked. I mean, wow. Her, her skin cleared up. She's able to go in the sun. I mean, our entire life was changed. Hello, welcome to the Dr. Joy Kong Show. So as you know, this show is all about health, healing, wellness, inspirations, and happiness. So whatever we can do to help making the, the world a happier place. And today I have a wonderful guest, uh, Dr. Efrat Lamandri, and she is called Dr. E, right? That's how, how you are okay. referred to. So, um, and she is a... Uh, nurse practitioner. She owns her own medical practice, EG Healthcare. Um, and she provides pediatric adult and geriatric care for to over 20,000 patients. Um, she also has taken conventional medicine to the next level with her signature process, the new method. So N E, I mean, K N E W method. And she can explain um, what, what that's all about. Um, this is really about um, healing people from the root level, right? Instead of treating, throwing drugs. I'm sure you're uh, educated just as I did, which is drug-centered education. Yes. So how did you become who you are uh, in your practice? And how do you think you differ, you differ from how other doctors help their patients? Um, that's a great question. First of all, Dr. Joy, I'm so excited to be here. And to all your listeners, thank you for giving me some of your air uh, space and air time. Uh, and I hope that we entertain you and give you some important topics to take home. So uh, as you said, uh, I have a practice called EG Healthcare, and it's kind of a typical primary care practice for families, pediatric, adult, geriatric. And when I started it, I did the typical thing. So for all you listeners, whatever you're imagining when you go to your primary care doctor, NP or PA, the annual visit, the sick visits, that's what EG Healthcare is about. And it's not wrong and it's important. And it's important if you have a disease, you certainly wanna find it and you certainly wanna treat it, but it's also not 100% right uh, because it is really geared to find disease and then treat it. And if you don't have a disease and maybe you're just not feeling well and you're in the world of unwellness, then there's no room for you in primary care. And if you do have a disease and you want to have a conversation about treating it without medication, then again, there's no room for you in primary care. So they're not wrong, but they're not completely right. Uh, I would like to share a personal story of what made me pivot from what you and I learned in school and to make a decision to provide different care. If you would indulge, indulge me in, so, in that. Um, so this, as always, I think most of us who went to school, we have to have some sort of personal experience either ourselves or our family where we realize, wait a minute, we need to, there's something more here. So in my case, it was when my wife was, she was diagnosed when I met her, my wife was a vampire. So not the cool kind of vampire that's immortal, but she had a disease called PMLE, which stands for polymorphous light eruption. And what that means is that she was allergic to the sun. So we jokingly called her a vampire because we couldn't go out in the sun. <laughs> and, um, but we were, you know, we managed, right? What do you do when you get your first diagnosis or your first pill or your first aches and pains? You manage. We just didn't go out and during the day, we just changed our life accordingly. And we just accepted it as our fate. But then the second autoimmune happened, which for those of you listening, autoimmune comes in more than one. And we're gonna talk about why later. The second autoimmune came for her, which is psoriasis, which is so severe, was on her feet. She couldn't walk without her feet bleeding. And so that's when we were like, wait a minute, maybe we should stop accommodating and start searching. And for many of you listeners, you know, sometimes that second diagnosis or something that pushes you over the edge that makes you think, well, it's time to do something else. So I'm in medicine, my wife's in medicine, all our friends are in medicine, and everyone offered us some form of high dose 
medication. And that's not what we wanted. And none of our schooling gave us the answer. And there's a lot of schooling between all of us. So someone suggested that we go to functional medicine and we were like, mm, okay, but you know, insert eye roll here. Like that's not really gonna be a thing, but what do we have to lose? So we went and he ran this crazy blood work that we never heard of before. And he changed our diet. What? We have a great diet. What, like, what are you talking about? We, you know, we, we didn't think we had a bad diet. Uh, gave us some supplements. And guess what? <laughs> it worked. I mean, wow. her, her skin cleared up. She's able to go in the sun. I mean, our entire life was changed, completely changed, blown away personally, but also professionally, because we were never told... Dr. Joy, you, you were never told that diet's gonna cure PMLE, right? In med school. We're never told that diet's gonna cure psoriasis. In fact, if you mention it, you're kind of like, like on the edge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been to many a Durham lecture when I suggested it and they're like, no, there's no connection. So, okay. Um, so I realized I have to bring this back to my practice and for many of my patients. So, I, you know, I went back to school Institute of Functional Medicine, got my PhD in integrative medicine. And then I brought it back to the practice in the form of the new method. Wow. Yeah. So, so what did you think when you were going through all the functional medicine training in, in comparison to <laughs> all that you've been taught? Because you have a PhD as well. Yeah. So it's the upside down show, right? I mean, I don't know your entire background, but I could imagine that you at some point had to experience this, right? Where you're like, wait a minute, no one told us to look under the rock to see what's happening here, right? Where you just you learn all these things. And again, they're not wrong. And, and if you have certain diseases, you certainly want to follow an algorithm. It's just not the whole story. And I just remember constantly being blown away. And then, you know, practicing with my patient constantly being blown away by the results. So what I decided to do because I come from the land of conventional medicine is really important for me to structure this so that I can, you know, just make it methodical because that's we're, we're from, you know, the scientific mindset. So the new method does that. What we do is we have, we have a, like a patient journey where you come in and you um, have certain blood work done, blood work that is far beyond what's done during a primary care visit. We do saliva testing or adrenal fatigue. And then we actually spend time with our patient, getting to know our patient. Like we set aside a full hour, which is mind blowing because the annual visit is about seven minutes mm -hmm. and um, not, not any doctor's fault. It's just the way the system is set up in order to be able to survive. Um, there's no malice here. I just want to make sure that, you know, everyone is trying. And um, then we go over the results and we use software that tracks not only results, but tracks symptoms. Because for a lot of patients, if there's no diagnosis, but they have aches and pains, you know, what are you tracking? If their labs are normal, what are you tracking, right? It's one thing if you have a cholesterol and you can track it go down, diabetes, the A1C go down. But what are you tracking on the patient who doesn't feel good, has brain fog or, or, or joint pain? You have to track their symptoms. So we use software so we can monitor our progress or monitor flare-ups. And then we work with our patients for an entire year. Like our patients have to be dedicated for a year because it took you this long to get messed up. It's going to take us more than one visit to, you know, unmess you up. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's been a very interesting ride. Yeah. So what do you see in your practice as far as um, maybe patients before you've adopted this new method? you know, how they did versus after you've brought all that in and or patients who have gone through other doctors who've tried everything. And then what happened after they used, you know, your method? To answer your question, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned about the patients because uh, it's also patient dependent. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, I need a doctor that is thinking in a certain way. It's really patient dependent because Ichi Healthcare still exists and it still has thousands of patients because certain patients are not ready to make the change. 
they are either, you know, whatever's going on in life, no judgment. They're not ready to make the change or they're comfortable medication or their lifestyle, the way it is, they want to keep it a certain way and they're willing to pay the price and have to take medication in order to maintain their lifestyle, right? Like the patient who wants to smoke and wants to be on an inhaler, the patient who wants to eat a lot of carbs and is willing to be on diabetes medication. So those patients still need to be in some sort of conventional medicine setting. The patients who want a different answer, new method and functional medicine is for them. So for those patients, what I see is, you know, I don't want to say the word miraculous because it's not a miracle, but it, it feels miraculous. It's not a miracle because there's science behind it. But you have patients primarily, you know, over 50 and over who are just not feeling great. And many of them have resigned to the fact that it's just their age or for women, it's just their hormones. They've just been advised it's their hormones and they just kind of what are you going to do? Go out to pasture and just it's supposed to hurt when you go up the stairs. You know, you're, so, you're supposed to have hot flashes. You absolutely have to have hot flashes. It has to be hormonal, right? And you just kind of live your life. And, and there's really nothing that, you know, is offered to them outside of, you know, accept it. And their peers are in the same group. So like, why would they think otherwise? So many of them come to me because they're just, they're saying, well, the tagline for the new method is, you always knew there was a better way. That's why it's spelled K-N-E-W. They always knew the better way. So people come like, I really think there's something else going on with me. It's not just my age. You know, ever since this happened, I'm feeling this way. And when we change their lifestyle, change their diet, put them on supplements, suddenly, you know, I have one patient that just he said to me, and within 30 days, he said, I didn't realize how hard it was for me to pick up my wallet when it fell on the floor. I used to groan on the way down to pick up my wallet. And now when I go pick up my wallet, I just do it. And I didn't realize how effortless it is. Uh, so so what's, the, what's the main thing you did for him? Um, yeah, so for him- Got him to that place. For him, it was just a diet change. For him, he wasn't on medication yet. Um, he just really was eating the standard American diet, which is inflammatory. So he was one of those patients who everything's fine. His A1C went fine. He wasn't diabetic. His cholesterol was fine. There's nothing you could do for you. But when we checked his inflammatory markers, they were really high. Mm. His CRP was high. His ESR was high. So, but in primary care, what can you do with inflammatory markers? Nothing. There's no medicine for it. And you just say, don't worry about it. Or you just don't even test for it. But when we see those markers, we're like, okay, your whole body's on fire. Let's calm it down. With him, it was really as simple as just removing some of the processed food, the refined food, and um, getting him some quality supplements, some good omegas, which is amazingly anti-inflammatory, some NAC. And within a month, right? So it's important I'm telling you in a month because it's not just the conversation of weight loss, right? Because the weight loss took time. He was a heavy fellow. So weight the weight loss took months, but he started feeling better almost immediately because his inflammation went down. Mm -hmm. So this is someone that if he would have went on some sort of weight loss program that never addressed the inflammation, he would have lost the weight, but he would still be in pain. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. Have you seen people who only went on the weight loss journey, but really without addressing their, their issues in a, from a functional medicine, you know, more detailed manner. Um, have you, have you seen that people were just uh, skinny and thick and yes. you know, bad? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, that's a really great question. I mean, I have people who are post bypass surgery that had right bypass surgery, but then they've learned that they can still have milkshakes and they're so, so it's, they're skinnier but they're not eating anything less inflammatory. And I've had people who come to me and they say, I've been on every diet in the world, nothing works for me. And I'm like, right, because that's not what we're doing. We're not doing that. Of course it didn't work for you. So yeah, I see it all the time. And you know, in addition to inflammation, a topic that comes up a lot in, this, in our age group is thyroid. So a lot of patients will say to me, you know, my, they can't get my thyroid right. They bring it up, they bring it down, they bring it up, they bring it down. You know, the, my meds keep changing. I started at 25, now I'm at 225. And again, 
It's not a weight loss conversation. Again, that's a conversation of what's going on in your body. Are you inflamed? If we don't calm down inflammation, if we don't calm down what's causing the autoimmunity, right? Because for a lot of people, thyroid, if you have Hashimoto's, it's an autoimmune thyroid. If we don't get to the core of the autoimmune and help stop this antibodies from happening, well, then yeah, your thyroid, of course, because it's 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 not the medication's gonna fix it, right? You have to get to the cause of it. So Certainly, to answer your question, I have plenty of patients who have tried weight loss approaches, but yet their issues are unresolved because they never got to the heart of it. Mm, yeah. So you have a lot of experience treating thyroid conditions. And what are you, what's your, your, your usual approach? Because, uh, yeah. you know, besides just giving them thyroid replacement. So that, I love um, treating thyroid because it's so common. Um, it really, um, you know, plagues a lot of people. And the one, and again, the one thing that's never discussed is how diet is connected to hypothyroid, specifically Hashimoto's, like autoimmune hypothyroid. Some people have hypothyroid for other reasons, but autoimmune hypothyroid, not to get too technical, but it's often a conversation of an inflamed belly, leaky gut, and the gluten sensitivity. Mm. So, you know, just quick recap for your audience, antibodies are, we all know about antibodies at this point in the game, which is what your body forms when it's trying to attack a foreign object, right? We're not supposed to have antibodies to ourselves. Yeah, people who have Hashimoto's have antibodies to their own thyroid. So their bodies are constantly attacking their own thyroid. They're stuck in the loop. So they take the medication because their, their thyroid's not producing a hormone, they take that hormone, but they never stop the attack on the thyroid. And for a lot of people, I mean, the, one of the first things you, you should do if you have Hashimoto's is just get off of gluten. Here's the thing, if I'm wrong, big deal, you're gluten-free, I didn't cause you any harm, I didn't give you any side effects. <laughs> but if I'm right, then I may have saved your thyroid. I'm not saying I can reverse it, but we could save it from worsening. Hmm. And that is because, um, the protein in gluten, which is called gliadin, is very similar to the enzyme in your thyroid called transglutaminase. Sorry, I have to think about it for a minute. They're very similar. So when the, if you have a leaky gut and your body's attacking gliadin, it, through molecular mimicry, which just means things look like each other, will start attacking the enzyme in your thyroid. So every time you have cereal, every time you have a sandwich, even if it's on a whole grain bread and you think you're doing the right thing, you're creating attack on your thyroid. So if we don't address this, your thyroid's never going to be right. So this is, this is one, one of my favorite things. And by the way, just so you know, if you, getting your thyroid might, right doesn't mean you'll be off meds. It means you'll stop being like up and down with your meds and you won't have increases, you'll just be steady. Sometimes in early stages, you can prevent and lessen and reduce, but if you've had it for a long time, then the goal is to just stabilize it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So um, I know you are really uh, big on helping people reduce their inflammation. So um, it, I assume diet will be the, the, <laughs> the foundation for, <laughs> for reducing inflammation. And um, what, what's your approach when, when yeah. people come to you, you know, in their middle age or, you know, later on in life and they just, you know, things are just not, you know, working as well as before. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I hate to say it because people don't want to hear it, but yeah, diet is the mainstay because it's, it's what you do all day long. So what you eat and when you eat is really, really important for um, inflammation without a doubt. Um, and when I say when we eat, I do promote intermittent fasting when it's appropriate. I do recommend initially, initially, not forever, a really restricted diet, which means gluten-free, grain-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, not forever, initially, because we have to calm the system down as quickly as possible, get, this, get the symptoms down. And then we reintroduce slowly and we notice what comes back up. Let me give you an example, because this, I actually did my, my thesis on this, because it hmm. blew my mind. So we collect all this data on all these patients. We have this questionnaire. I didn't create the questionnaire. Smarter people than I did create the questionnaire. One of the questions is, do you have tinnitus? 
um, do you have ringing in your ears? And I've always ignored it because I don't know about you, Dr. Joy, but I always learned that once you have tinnitus, it's pretty uncurable unless you're on aspirin and you come off the aspirin, right? It's just, it's just is what it is, learn to live with it. So I always kind of ignore this. Well, months into using the software, I started noticing that people who came in with high numbers, two and three months into the diet was going to zero. Mm. Like, what the heck are you telling me that tinnitus is inflammatory? Because I, I never learned this. So, I, you know, I did some digging and turns out yeah. that, yes, tinnitus is inflammatory. Unless, of course, it's post-trauma, you know, my soldiers, my police officers, I'm sorry, I probably can't help you there. But for other people who didn't have trauma, it's inflammatory. Mm. So back to this diet. So we put you on this restricted diet. And let's just say your tinnitus goes down to a one or a zero. And if we reintroduce something, even something that you think is healthy, an eggplant, and suddenly the tinnitus comes back, that's a flare up. And we can know that that's not for you. So by calming it down really quickly, restricting really quickly, and then slowly loosening that up, we can kind of see what's flaring you up. So that is how we start with more patients. That how long should patients. the restricted period be? So it depends on the patient and the goal. And as I was going to say also, even the type of restriction depends on the patient. For example, and then I'm going to talk about the length, but I just don't want to think that even the diet is, you know, one size fits all because the diabetics, you have, if they're on medication, you have to go a little easy with the, you know, with the no carb and the fasting. Um, patients who have some predisposition to Alzheimer's, you want to be careful with how much meat they're taking in if they have the gene for it. So it's not a one size fits all, but generally speaking, Length of time depends on the goals. So if the patient also has a weight loss goal in mind, then the longer we stay restricted, the faster we get there. Mm -hmm. Some patients don't want to lose any weight. So we're just gonna track it based on the symptoms. Okay, we got to the symptoms, we got there, we can start loosening up. What if we only got halfway there and we needed a little more time, especially GI issues. So it's patient dependent, but you know, really quick would be 30 days, I would say, three months is ideal because it gives your body a chance to repair and we're going to give you supplements also to help repair your belly and then if we're, you know the introduction can be done slowly and then you, at the end you kind of graduate as it were with a diet that is very specific to you because your body told you what it needs your body made the decision by letting you know the flare-ups it told you what it needs very specific to you and will have a lot of the things that you know you had before, but will eliminate the things that your body is clearly telling you not to do. It won't be a list that will be your body communicating to you. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And of course, these days, um, I think people are very confused when it comes to diet. Um, even yeah. I get confused because I, I listen to various experts. They all seem to know what they're doing. Uh, and uh, very, very well schooled and have completely op opposing point of views. So <laughs> it, so it does get very challenging. I can imagine what people are, are wondering, should I go low carb? Should I go, go you know, low fat? Um, should, should I, yeah, should I avoid animal products? I mean, all these are, it, it's, it's very confusing time. You know, it is. And I'm certainly not going to sit here and say that my way is, is the right way. I could just say that this is because we use the symptoms to track it. If the symptoms get better, right? Like I said earlier, it's not just enough to just say, okay, my A1C get better, but I can't go up the stairs. If you're feeling better, then it's the right diet for you. And if I'm doing it and you're feeling worse, it's the, it's the wrong diet for you. So I feel like it doesn't get much simpler than, than that. I mean, in addition to tracking labs and making sure you're okay and you haven't created any issues if you're feeling better then what could be a better um understand you know uh, proof that you're on the right diet yeah right and and but, sometimes i'm sorry oh no i yeah okay. go ahead i was gonna say sometimes it's more complex than that right this this is the easy patient right? sometimes i have i've had patients where even though we remove things they still had gi discomfort or they still had, you know, certain skin issues. And it was like, well, what else can we remove? 
And that's when you have to start thinking about specialized testing. That's when we start doing labs like Cyrix labs or special stool testing, because then it's a little bit more complex. So I'll give you an example. I had a patient, very thin woman, already kind of eating really well before she came to me. When I came to her, I just tweaked it a little bit more. The weight loss wasn't an issue. You know, compliance with diet wasn't an issue. And even though I tweaked it a little bit more, she still had GI um, issues. So we, the first test we ran, again, I always try to wait a few months before we start spending money on tests because sometimes we don't need it. First test we ran, turns out that within her healthy foods, she was very sensitive to spinach and tomatoes. Who the heck would have known spinach and tomatoes? Like, oh, right? So that we removed that. And, uh -huh. that. and that was like something that she ate often. So it got a little bit better, but not 100%. So then we did stool testing and we discovered that she doesn't have enough digestive enzymes. Yeah. So, but we had to go very slow with digestive enzymes. She couldn't handle them, you know, at every meal. So we started like once, once every other day. And again, because we tracked her symptoms, we started, we, what we started tracking was how many days between flare-ups. So if before it was flare-ups every day, and we got to every other day, so then we added another enzyme and we got, to, so now I just saw her recently, we're up to seven to 10 days between flare-ups. And that's how we're, you know, marking her improvement because the, the labs are perfect. Her labs are pristine. So, um, so sometimes you have to get a little bit more than just the diet. And it depends on, on what's going on with the patient. Yeah, you really have to be a superb detective to, because <laughs> you're, 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 you're really fine tuning and you're, you're mm -hmm. just, you, you know, and, and all these little symptoms can have a multitude of, of causes. And, you know, the conventional medicine, you know, because, because the symptoms is too little, they, they just, they just brush it off. This is, well, yeah, it's too bad. You know, drink some more water, do more yeah. exercise. <laughs> yeah. So, when you know, it, I'm glad you mentioned exercise because everyone tells their patients, just go exercise. Right. And some basis, so we test for adrenal fatigue and not to get too into it, but there's three phases of adrenal fatigue, one, two, and three. Phase three, they're exhausted. They have nothing left. They're running on fumes. You tell a phase three or to go exercise, they can't. These are the people that after the exercise, they need a nap. So a conventional you know, medicine doctor would say, you really should exercise. Great. So now they try to exercise, they're exhausted. No one understands why they're not invigorated from exercise. And now they start like, self-doubt, self-hate, like I'm so lazy, I can't go, what's wrong with me, right? So now you have this whole conversation in your head. And if someone, sometimes I sit with them, I was like, don't exercise until I tell you to exercise. Don't exercise until two or three months from now, when you come back to me and tell me you have energy, that's when we're gonna talk about exercise. Because mm. you try to exercise now, there's nothing left in your system. It's just gonna take us backwards. So. Even something as simple as like everyone should exercise is not even a one size fits all. Yeah, I love it. I've never heard a doctor saying that I don't want you to exercise yet. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what they prescribe for all ailments. For everyone. For everyone. <laughs> but you know that some patients, like when they exercise, they're, they're depleted. Right. And so if you tell them to exercise, now they're just stuck. Also, the stress, the mental stress that does on them because everyone else is invigorated and they feel like poop when they're done, you know, working out and they don't know what's wrong with them. And that does a whole mind game that worsens things. So we give them that out. And now after three months, when they're feeling great, I'm like, okay, now let's talk. But, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I like that, um, you know, kind of elimin elimination diet uh, in the beginning. So you're eliminating um, all gluten, dairy, um, and, um, grains and sugar, grains and sugar. Okay. Initially, right. For those first 30 days, because we don't know what's irritating you. Mm -hmm. So we're taking on the, the classic irritants off. Remember, this is just, this is not forever. I don't, no one could do this forever. <laughs> and so you don't want to set people up for failure by saying, this is how you have to live forever. Thanks. Last year, I'll never climb back temporary 
and I always do it in the beginning, where some people do it the other way. Some people eliminate slowly. I think we eliminate in the beginning because that's when the patient's most motivated. They're mm. not feeling well. They just came in. They're ready to do the work. So capture it, right? It's like that first month at the gym. Capture it. Because if their symptoms, if they start feeling better, that's it. They're, they're ready to continue, right? But if you go slowly and remove things, people don't want to have things removed six months later after made the decision to start to do this. I think it's harder psychologically. Yeah. Because I know there's that mindset that removes things slowly. Yeah. Now, that being said, again, patient dependent. If I have a patient I'm still talking to about whether or not McDonald's is appropriate, that's a patient that I may not go completely and we could just talk about what we could order at McDonald's, right? Maybe we could order the salad, right? So some patients are not quite ready there. So it is patient dependent. And some patients, you know, when you're talking about fasting, you know, like if you take their coffee away with the way they have with their cream and their sugar, they'll walk out, right? So sometimes you have to the world do- collapses. <laughs> so sometimes you have to be patient where they are. But- just describing the ideal scenario. Right, right. Um, so I like your approach that you kind of, you know, you don't go crazy with testing right from the start. You go with the diet change and you do, you know, some more basic set of labs. And then you, you, you watch how they do with this <clears throat> new diet. Yes. And uh, maybe some supplements. And if things don't get better, then you peel the onion again. Yes. yes. Yeah, I like that because some doctors, they will, you know, do, you know, five, six hundred dollars or a thousand dollars test all at once. And they're bombarding. You can't eat this. You can't eat that. Oh, you've got, <laughs> you know, you're toxic. And so we should do some chelation therapy and you need to, you know, here's this hormone. Here's this, you know, other, yeah, other herb. It just, it gets very crazy, I think, and overwhelming for people. You know, you brought up such a good point because if you test everyone, we probably all have some heavy metals. We probably all have some mold. We probably have all have some hormonal imbalances. So it's not just a question of finding it, but is that what's causing your symptom, mm -hmm. right? So if I clean up your diet and everything is perfect, you're symptom-free, then do I really need to chelate you just because I found it in there, right? I don't, it, it, that's not causing your symptom. So why would I want to find, now, if I clean up your diet, you're moving, we're getting quality supplements, you're getting IV infusions, you're on point, you're still not feeling well, then yeah, likely something else is causing it and then we need to hunt it down. But you know, you, you try, so you try not to treat the test. And if you're just going to test for everything, I think almost all of us in this polluted environment are going to come up with positive for things, but it doesn't mean it's causing us symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it probably could still undermine us in some ways, but it is not, is not acute. So after you get everything addressed, you're feeling pretty good. And if you want to further, yes, you know, on your biohacking journey, and then you can do some more. Uh, yes. there, there's endless tests. There's genetic yes. tests. There's <laughs> endless. Yes. Endless. Yes. Yeah. But I, I agree with you, but I, I let the patient lead the way. If they want to do more, we do more. If they're not there yet, we, I mean, I, I love a good hunt. Don't get me wrong. I just want to make sure. And the other thing is this, let's just say you are mold toxic and I have patients who are mold toxic. The treatment mold toxicity is very taxing on the body, right? We have to detox the liver. So I want to make sure that we're going into that treatment in your best possible version of you, the version that's eating good quality food, already taking supplements, some NAC to like help, you know, get your liver ready for that process. So the timing is also about getting you as a host ready for whatever treatment we need to decide. If we're going to decide to do hormones, we want to make sure that our hormones are balanced food-wise, that you're not, you don't have elevated testosterone because you're eating all these carbs. And now I'm giving you this other stuff, right? Let's normalize the hormones that we can just by you know, balancing your insulin and your thyroid and everything else, but top down. And then if we need it as a host, you're ready to have the most optimal results by getting those hormones. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because um, um, I've had a patient who 
um, got very sickly, you know, felt really bad um, doing testosterone uh, replacement. And um, there's a lot of inflammation in his body. So, so that's exactly kind of, kind of what you said, you know, if you haven't calmed the inflammation, you haven't helped the body to be in a more steady and calm state, and then you put this amplifying hormone in the body that is amplifying everything. God, I'm so glad you mentioned testosterone because <laughs> everyone wants testosterone. I'm like, who said right? it's and issue? Women. Yes. Who said it's even an issue? In fact, now you have hypertension. Now you're taking medication to block the, you know, the effects of the testosterone. Now you're giving blood because your blood's too thick. Like, what? What? It's so it's its own train that went off the tracks. And yeah, well, it's a very popular subject because people want, you know, they want to increase lean mass, decrease fat. They want to, you know, feel energetic. Of course, the sexual function. It's it just. It's very popular. So yeah, in no, what I, cases do you, would you give people testosterone? Yeah. And I'm not against testosterone for sure not, but appropriate. So let's give an example. So with men, when I work with men, you know, if they have a belly, we have to get rid of that first, right? Because that's estrogenic and that estrogen is pushing testosterone down. So if you're, before I start giving you, let's see what your body produces. When I get rid of that estrogen belly that you have going on there that you call a beer belly, but when I call it estrogen <laughs> belly, they don't like that so much, right? Uh, I like what? it. I have an estrogen belly? What are you talking about? So <laughs> we get rid of the estrogen belly and you start lifting a little bit of weights. Many times the testosterone starts elevating by itself and we don't have to introduce, but I certainly have patients where in month number three, they're doing the work, they lost the weight and their testosterone is still not budging. That's a great candidate for testosterone. I believe in bioidentical hormone therapy that's applied daily. I don't like injections that bring you up and then bring you down. It's not my jam, just putting it out there. I think we wanna keep you kind of steady daily because um, then we eliminate like, you know, emotional, um, labile and, and, and you know just outbursts um so that's that's what i like to do and for women women need testosterone also but with them sometimes it's the opposite um sometimes it's elevated and it looks normal because you know it's like if you pull let me just explain post hormonal women should be like a zero testosterone if you're 65 and you're walking with a testosterone level of 30 you're eating a lot of carbs. We have to figure this out, right? So before I start talking to you about estrogen and you know and, and progesterone, um, I know it's of that testosterone moment. I have to see what that looks like when you don't have all this insulin resistance going on. So now for for postmenopause women, if it's at zero and they're feeling symptomatic and we did the work, for sure I'll get on testosterone. Again, bioidentical hormone therapy. And um, topically, and I think it's great. Uh, so, so yeah, there's a room for it. But what we do now is just like, oh, you're tired, you have muscle pain. Here you go. Here's some testosterone. No one cares about your high blood pressure. No one cares about your how thick your blood is. Right? It's well, fine. There's a recommended <laughs> dose dose range for for testosterone for women. Right? So, it was like you know, yeah, like. I remember it was 35. Like, so it's like point, it's 0.25 to one milligrams a day topically. And for men, you start at 25 milligrams. Right. And you know that what you're getting when, when people get injected is way higher than that. Mm. And um, it's, it's concerning. <laughs> it's concerning because then they come to me in my primary care practice and I have to deal with their blood pressure being high and you know where do they go to to you know do phlebotomy to get rid of the you know the thick blood that they have because now they're at high risk for a stroke or heart attack all because of testosterone so they're chasing a different loop that testosterone loop what happens is oh i feel achy let's give you some testosterone initially that first testosterone you get that first month you're going to feel amazing hmm. then you're going to keep spending the rest of your time on testosterone that kind of testosterone 
chasing that high, which you're never going to get again because that's not your problem. The problem is not your testosterone. Well, these these people's testosterone is like at a, like over a thousand. It's clearly, that's not the issue anymore. If you're still achy and not feeling well, and the libido is an issue, can't possibly be testosterone if your testosterone levels at a thousand, right? So for some reason, that's lost on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what uh, what other methods do you use to help people decrease their inflammation and 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 improve their vitality? Like some important things that's part of your regimen. Okay, so we, of course nutrition we discussed supplements. I love supplements, not instead of, but as part of this complete breakfast. And every time I say that, I know how old I am because that was in our commercials. Uh, I'm 50, by the way. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, supplements. I love supplements because there's just certain things like even if you have a high quality food, you need. Um, again, it's dependent on what's going on with you, but I think everyone should be on a high quality multivitamin. Everyone should be on NAC, which breaks down into glutathione, which is like an antioxidant that you know is magical for your liver. Uh, everyone should be on vitamin D. Of course, check your levels. They should be on some vitamin D. That's that's a baseline. And I think almost everyone should be on some hormone omega because it's so great for inflammation. And that's that's your baseline. That's what I start my patients on as a basement. And then we customize based on, on what we see. So supplements is a big part of what's happening. Sleep. Oh my goodness, sleep. We have to optimize your sleep. If you're eating you know, gluten-free ice all day and taking all your supplements and you're not sleeping, we're not reducing your inflammation. And, you know, for those of you who are concerned about memory loss or Alzheimer's, if you don't get your sleep in, just look it up. If you don't get your sleep in, cognitive decline is happening. You have to sleep, quality sleep, seven to eight hours. You know, that mindset of like, whoever sleeps less, you know, early bird gets the worm and, you know, Top CEOs only sleep for three hours. No, don't believe the hype. <laughs> you need to sleep. And we try to optimize it. A lot of it, again, goes back to nutrition. Because if you have a glass of wine at night, you're not sleeping. Mm. You have a big meal before you go to sleep, you're not sleeping. Um, so distancing your last meal from dinner, making sure there's no alcohol, a lot of carbs at dinner. Um, you'll sleep better. And then sometimes you need supplements that are melatonin and you know other supplements to help you sleep. Stress, we have to talk about stress, self-care, right? So we need that as well. Mm-hmm. Everyone has stress. I'm not telling you that we need to go out and hug a tree every day, although that would be nice. I'm just saying you need to take moments for yourself in your stressful life. Um, I think those are the pillars or nutrition, um, how we eat when we eat, how we sleep, the supplements we take, and how we're managing our stress. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exercise. Yeah. <laughs> That's bit. the foundation. That's, but it's a journey. Um, we can always keep optimizing. I mean, the, there are more and more things they're discovering, you know, even, even there's just a, from uh, genetics, right? What, who is fit to do what? you know, what kind of, um, what kind of food is best for you? What kind of exercise is best for you? We're all built so differently. Um, and that, that's what I realized that, um, you know, people, people talk about certain diet being best for them, but it may not be the best for you, you know, um, because that's your body just doesn't digest that type of food, you know, in, in the most, uh, you know, beneficial way. And, um, even people with, um, you have to, to look at what, what, what does your brain do? Because some people may have addiction, right? May have food addiction, mm-hmm. may have carb addiction. So the high carb diet may work for somebody that, um, that doesn't have food addiction, but doesn't mean that you can touch it, you know, that, that, that is, you know, all free for you. So it's, it's just, it's very complex, but I think it's a journey. And I, I hope people realize that this is a journey and, and you know, enjoy getting to know yourself. Yes, <laughs> that's a really good point. And, you know, the carb thing that you brought up is really important because people have a family history for diabetes, right? And so that means that person A 
will have just a little bit of carbs and they'll develop diabetes. Mm. A person B that doesn't have the genes, they could still get diabetes, but they'll have to eat the carbs for much longer, for many more years before they get diabetes. And it feels unfair because how come, you know, Joe Schmo can have all this pizza and not get diabetes. And as soon as I look at bread, I have diabetes. Mm-hmm. And that is genetics. But knowing that is really important. Knowing that, you know, your neighbor's diet is not necessarily going to work for you. It's a really good point that you bring up. So yeah, good. yeah. I mean, that's the, the wisdom that in the end, people say, have a diet, take a diet that's the best for you. Find yeah. your, <laughs> it's like, Jesus, that's not helping. I have to find my own diet. <laughs> But it's true, it's true which, is, which is why you know we create like we create a system because we have to start somewhere which is why we do it so restricted but then ultimately where we end up is so patient dependent mm-hmm. yeah yeah this is such a good discussion yeah you know a lot of really helpful tips for people um so but you mentioned nac can people still get it Yes, you know, I know that there's like this conversation of a shortage, but we haven't experienced it. Have you experienced it? Um, I have not. <laughs> I've not <laughs> tapped into it, so I haven't looked at it. But I know there's this big, there's a big push. But but you have been able to. Uh, We've been able to get it. Um, good. So for you know, for your listeners who may not know, there's this big push to regulate NAC because I don't know the powers that be think that. It should be regulated. Um, so far, it hasn't been, and so we've been able to offer it orally. Uh, NAC, as I said, breaks down to glutathione, and then we also give it in IVs as uh, glutathione push. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good news. <clears throat> we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. So. Um, you know, one reason I wanted to invite you on the podcast is because, you know, you're doing medicine in, in this new fashion. And I think that's really where things are going. Um, you know, medicine is going through a seismic change. People may not realize, you know, people who are stuck in conventional medicine, they, they're not seeing it coming and that they're dismissing, dismissing, and their patients who are so locked in by their doctors that they think the doctors know know it all and the sad truth is that what most doctors practice in conventional medicine is 20 years behind what the science is showing because you 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 had a phd so you're in the science aspect so you know science is way ahead of medicine and it's and what i love about functional medicine or anti-aging medicine you know this whole group of medicine is that it's following it's following new research it's like whatever that's coming in, we are absorbing it, and that's why it's so so exciting. And and yeah. um, and it's it's just gonna take over. I think I, it has to t- it has to take over. And and here's the thing about functional medicine: I can't hurt I can't hurt you. I'm not giving you a pill that's gonna have a side effect. Okay, I can't hurt you if I if I help you eat healthier and, and get more sleep. I can't harm you. Um, whereas some of the things that we do, myself included in primary care, I mean, have you, if you read the side effects, they're scary. Um, so, you know, this, and you constantly have to, when you're prescribing things, risk reward, risk reward, you know, I, I gotta give it to them because guidelines says I really have to, but I know that all these things can happen. It's, it's a terror. I'm actually more terrified when I practice primary care because I know all the side effects of what I'm prescribing, but yet I, I have to give it. Um, you know, whereas in functional medicine, I'm, I'm worry free. Like I, I know, I know what we're doing is good for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great place to be in. It's wonderful. So, um, how, you're in New York, right? So how do people find you? Um, so the website is the new method and new is spelled with a K the new method. And that's true also for Instagram, Facebook, apparently I'm very popular in TikTok. also I'm not really sure why. So it's, <laughs> is the new method by Dr. E. We also have YouTube and any of those, whatever platform you like, there is a way to just book a free consult. If you ever wanted to, you're not sure what we offer, what we do, we could do a virtual consult and we could talk about, but also if you just go on our platforms, I, I give a lot of advice. Um, my book is coming out May 11th. And in that book, it's called, it's not in your head because mm. so many people are goals in their head. 
And I really give a step-by-step -step guide for you to be able to manage this on your own if you want to, because I really want to empower patients to be able to figure this out on their own. It, you know, it's not about me holding all that information. So when this book comes out, you know, hopefully you get it and it helps you because that's the whole point of writing it. And um, yeah, I hope to, to hear from you guys, but even if I don't, please use the messages, please use the videos, the platforms to help yourself get to a better place. Wonderful. Yeah. We'll put a link in the, in the information below as well. Sounds so, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. It's Thank you for your time. Fun. Yeah. It's been a everybody. fun interview. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. So I hope you have enjoyed our conversation. And if you did, please like and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you at the next episode.